Brandon question I saw. I know you don't watch him on YouTube, but um, maybe by chance did you see the uh, maybe maybe some theaters, the new trailer for Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, the animated one? No, I didn't know there's a new trailer for it yet. Oh, it looks really good. That's cool. Hopefully, it'll appear. In, well, I haven't seen the movie in theaters in like two weeks. It seems like since Han oh Solo. And a Bumblebee trailer. Um, yeah, I heard about that one. Which is not Michael Bay, so it's like, oh. I'm curious. I'm not, like, ecstatic, but I'm curious. Is it Bumblebee, like, in the Civil War fighting off and everything like that? No, it's like... like, Bumblebee! You know, he was actually a Confederate for a day, and then he changed. (laughs) They don't don't say a whole lot. They don't show a whole lot, because it's a teaser trailer, but it looks like they're trying to... It looks like it's an apology to fans. First off, he is actually an old Volkswagen. Secondly... Uh, they show Starscream for a minute, and he's like he old looks, school Starscream. He looks like old school Starscream. And apparently, Die, it takes Bumblebee! Place... I am here, Starscream. Like he's the only other robot you see. You see John Cena in military uniform. It looks kind of oh, like got John Cena in it. Yeah, he's like a military awesome. guy. It looks like it's about. It'd be like, awesome. If John uh... Cena's like, what's John Cena? Oh no, he's just in a he's just in a Transformer suit. <laughs> like <laughs> like a Godzilla that... movie or something like that. It's like. <laughs> Everything else is all CG. He's in this really tacky suit. No, um, it shows like this. It, there's this really... I've never seen this girl before, but she's fucking hot as fuck. This really hot girl who I guess is a mechanic who comes across the car and then she befriends Bumblebee and she's the, she looks like... They're doing the whole she's the main character thing, but still, you know, fit, fitting, fitting it all around him. And it just kind of shows just some cool imagery of just, you know, Bumblebee in robot form and then like, you know, dodging shit, you know, jumping around and then... Starscream for a second. It looks like, you know, like a movie Starscream, but this, like, you know, he's different. But at the same time, he has more of the original colors, like the red and the white, and you know. So that's cool. Yeah, that sounds awesome. If they, especially if they look more Transformers like, because I mean, it's not that the, they don't look cool in the movies. Because I will say the movies they do look neat, but they almost you can't look tell too, who they are. Most of they the they almost look too complicated. That's like that was always the kind of thing. It's like they almost need to be simplified. There's a reason. I mean, obviously in the cartoon, it's because they're animated. So it's like okay, shit, drawing robots and cars is already hard enough. Don't make them too complicated. But sometimes there's a it, more is not always better. I guess you could say. Optimus resembles, um, I think Optimus still looks kind of like Optimus. I think Bumblebee still looks kind of like Bumblebee. I mean, maybe because he's the only yellow one. But uh, beyond that, though, everybody else is like, oh, that one's Ironhide, that one's, and I get you change the colors or whatever. But uh, they actually kind of look a little bit more like they resemble, just for the quick, they only show Starscream for a second. But he looks like he resembles Starscream more of what you think of. So That's cool. if, I, if I had to guess, he's probably the villain of the movie because... This is the Megatrons and Frozen and Ice or whatever. So, and is this one a pure sequel to like number it's a, five? It's a prequel. It's, apparently, it takes place in the eighties. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Well, I guess that makes sense why that is. But uh, yeah, I wonder—is it still in line with the Transformers movie? I know I'm asking all these questions about. That's teaser. what I heard. That, that's what I heard. I heard it still takes place in the same universe, but I can honestly see him trying to do some things like. If this one gets a lot of good uh, praise, I can see them trying to like start up a new film from this. Not saying that's what they're gonna do, but I can honestly see them doing that. Like if this one, like, oh wow, this one did made a lot of money and people really like it critically. Uh, let's just try and pick it up from here and act like the other ones never happened. I can see them doing that. I'm not saying they will. But... Yeah, kind of almost. I guess you could say that's similar to like X Men. You know what I mean? Yeah, only they had a time travel to plot device, so. Yeah, you know, and then they time travel again in Deadpool 2, so there's a lot of time travel, a lot of confusing things. Yeah, I like the comics, so it's fitting. Okay, just in case you're confused on what's going on, this is the Old Man Orange Podcast, and I'm Spencer Scott Holmes. And I'm Ryan Dunnigan. And today we have a cool retrospect of a movie that I always kind of wanted to watch, always looked badass, you know, you just kind of run across it here and there and see some screenshots of it and so on, but it's the 1975 Charles Bronson flick, um, hard times. Now, tell me, how'd you make money? I knock people down. You mean like a prize fighter? No, they're pickup fights. The money's made on bets. What does it feel like to knock somebody down? It makes me feel a hell of a lot better than it does him. 1933, America had hit the skids. People were out of work and out of luck. Third refill costs a nickel. Life was as tough as a cheap steak. 
Suppose you've been down the long, hard road. Who has it? It was hard times. I got a husband in jail, no job, and no prospects. I don't look past the next bend in the road. A man had to live by his wits. Well, my man's just starting out. He's good, but I have to get long odds. What kind of odds are you talking about? Five to one. Three to one. D. Or by his fists. Columbia Pictures presents Hard Times, starring Charles Bronson as Cheney, a drifter. When I get enough change in my pocket, I'm going. A loner. Are you going to stay the night? Not this time. A man who spoke soft. I barely know you. Yeah, but would you like to? And hit hard. <laughs> James Coburn as Speed, a born con man. 50-50 on all scratch bets and expenses. All side bets, I keep 75%. That's how it works. Who can make a fortune in a day. I propose a toast to the... Best man I know, me. And lose it in a minute. I'm flat broke, I need some money fast. What the hell are you doing? You don't want no trouble. Just you pay your debts. Speed was the hustler. It was too damned easy. There ain't no rules about that, except who wins. Cheney was the hitter. You ever get scared when you do work? I don't think about it. Together, they just couldn't be beat. You give us our damn money now. You want that money? Take it. No, I got the gun. I don't think you want to use it. It's one way. You want to see another? Charles Bronson, James Colburn, Jill Ireland, and Struther Martin. They're a knockout. In hard times. Now, this is a movie I remember, I think I first heard about. I mean, I think I heard about the movie a few times, but I remember hearing a lot more about it on Junk Food Cinema maybe a year or two ago. I want to say that they did an episode of this. And essentially, it's about uh, about Charles Bronson and uh, James Corburn back in the 1920s or 1930s. Probably 1930s. Probably more on That's what I think. So by looking at the cars, because it doesn't really tell you, but I almost kind of like how this movie doesn't really give you like any hints. It just kind of like the movie just plays out. You know what I mean? It's, there's never like, oh, this is the date, and this is what's going on. It's just like, it's almost like a camera was just kind of set around this character, and you just kind of like watch what was going on in his life. Yeah, and it takes place around, I'm going to say, assume somewhere in the 1930s during the Great Depression. And it's just Charles Bronson is just plays a guy named Cheney, and he's just some hobo drifting from town to town, getting into street fights, and then he bumps shoulders with James Corber and a guy named Speed, who... He's just he's just like the fast talking kind of con man fight promoter who ends up saying like, oh, well, I can use some money. And it looks like you can use some money. Come this way, kid. Even though you're older than me, I'm still going to call you kid for a second. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're, they're probably like the same age, really. It's just I think Charles Bronson just, you know, well, it's, it's just like um, James Coburn always had like white hair. It felt like he had white hair like in every movie. You know what I mean? He's kind of like a Steve Martin or something like that. I feel like the youngest he ever was was maybe 36 He's just born old. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's like some of the black and white movies, but that doesn't really help. Once he gets black and white, he still looks kind of old. <laughs> well, he's like, um, he's just he's just one of those guys. I've only seen him like this is probably one of the because you're right. He does have just kind of like gray hair a lot. But I think he's just one of those guys who has naturally gray hair and it's not not the age then do it or anything. I um I've just he's one of those actors like Charles Bronson. I'm always used to seeing them looking grizzled and beaten up. Like Charles Bronson just looks like a piece of beaten beef jerky. <laughs> yeah, and that's what he always does with a little bit of an Asian look to him. He always has that. Yeah, he always do, he looks like that. He looks kind of like a Chinese man, sort of. <laughs> he does, but he just I think it's just because he's been working out in the field all days and he doesn't. He's like, I don't need no sunglasses. Yeah, so he's just got the kind of squinty stare, almost like Clint Eastwood, but... Like, he's Clint Eastwood if Clint Eastwood never turned it off. <laughs> yeah, exactly, just always on and everything like that. And then with his, he always has like, kind of like a little mustache, too, which I don't know why. That almost that almost kind of gives him sort of that Asian look as well. It, funny thing, uh, this is still, re- not really to this movie, but still Charles Bronson. Did, did you ever, did you see that uh, one really random, I think it was like a 70s ad for Cologne, where Charles Bronson's all shirtless, he's trying to be like a sex symbol? That sounds sort of familiar, but either you, maybe you explained it to me at one point or something like that. Uh, if you, I went to Alamo Draft House, which is this um, kind of a, it's this movie chain 
they're kind of in a lot of uh, major cities and they're very strict about no talking. And if you go see a movie, they do kind of like this Quentin Tarantino thing. I'm sure he's not the only one to do it, but apparently if you go see a movie at Tarantino's place, he puts a bunch of old ads and old trailers in front of movies that would fit the time period this movie was coming out in. Mm-hmm. And Charlton, like if you go to a movie at the at Alamo Draft House, they might show you some funny shorts that kind of somehow link into the movie, or they also might show you some old ads if it's like a period piece or something. And I don't remember what the movie was, but they showed this old cologne commercial. And Bronson's like, you want to look like a man? You got to smell like a man or something like that. <laughs> just just shirtless, spraying himself down with this. And it was just like... Just like pretty much after a hard workout, Charles Bronson just puts some of his sweat in a vial, and that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. It's just like watch your. It's like watch your dad or whatever. <laughs> like after you get back, after he gets back from the gym, is what it felt kind of like. Well, that's like kind of like the look that Charles Bronson has because, like you know, it's like at that time period. That's you know, he's got like he's got like the old fashioned action star kind of look where they're like they look like buff and strong and everything like that, but they're not necessarily like ripped or I guess jacked. They just look very like just like almost like what i feel like that dad sort of strength not like a dad bod because now like that word dad bod started to turn into like oh that's like dad with his you know beer gut and like you know floppy arms and everything it's like no like what i always consider like old school dad where like you know maybe they're they're not defined but they just got you know big arms and they're strong and you know like they can fucking move a shed by themselves somehow some way or you know lift a fucking motor out of the car (laughs) like that that kind of (laughs) over one uh, over one shoulder (laughs) yeah like that that was like how my dad, like, I'd come back home from school and just like he would like just move shit around the yard. It's like, how'd you do that by yourself? <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, don't worry, I found a way. Yeah, you know, like moving a hot tub by yourself and so on. Just. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like it's one of those things where a lot of actors back then, a lot of action stars. You, I don't. We, we, you could see it if you look long enough. But I think a lot of action stars back then were guys that just had that look because they had those kind of jobs. Um, Charles Bronson was definitely one of those guys. Clint Eastwood was one of those guys. I'm going to assume James Corburn was definitely one of those guys. I'm going to assume. I can't say that for a fact. But Charles Bronson was one of those guys who was like, I think he had a mining job at some point and just, you know, just was one of those man's man kind of guys. And it's just like, hey, you look like you could be in pictures. Really? You think so? Yeah, yeah, I bet you could be in a movie. Sure, let's just see what happens. And he just kind of brought that with them, and people like that. So, yeah, you know, and I think someone like, oh, Steve McQueen, he probably did that for a little while, but he's probably that more middle of the road between that, you know, um, fate, like pretty boy, good looking guy, and the man's man, hard worker guy. I feel like someone like McQueen is right in between those. Yeah, and he's kind of like the in between of probably being like, he probably always did want to be an actor. Not like some of these other guys, it just feels like, you know, like Clint Eastwood, just like, you know, hey, you want to try acting? Well, uh, I guess I could try that one of these days, you know. Just doing this lifeguarding in the military right now. That's how I stayed out of Korea. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, got nothing else going on. I'm tired of watching fat people swim, so uh, might as well. It was either this or grabbing a rifle. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that's just sort of how you got into it. And that's how I feel like Charles Bronson is, too, because he just has that kind of look. They, it's like, you know, it's like him and Clint Eastwood, they're probably those guys who would like, they probably work out like almost as much as like, say like Arnold Schwarzenegger and so on is, but they have almost like a completely different build, you know, because that was like yeah. how Clint Eastwood was. And there was a time period like, you know, in the 50s and 60s and 40s and stuff like that. It was that weird thing where like, if you're caught working out, it was almost like you were weak. Like, well, you're not naturally strong, which is like such a, it's such a weird thing to kind of like think about. But there was a time period where literally if you were working out, it's like fucking pussy. Now shut up and have your dinner. They just put down like a steak with a with a with a whiskey and then a side of cigarettes. Yeah, only one workout. It's like you go out there and dig some ditches. That's a real man's workout. If you aren't don't buff from sun, don't put on sunscreen, you fucking bitch. Sun will bounce right off of you because you're a man. God damn it. You look at that sun straight in the eye and tell it to go fuck itself, and that's clearly what Bronson did. Look at his face. That's how the sun sets every night. <laughs> It's like, okay, okay, I'll go down, I'll go down. Just stop giving me that mean look, Mr. Bronson. I'm like, yeah, that's what I thought. The sun doesn't go down in time. Charles Bronson punches it in its ugly face. I just see it. Like, it's one of those things he's just looking at the horizon. It's not going down. It's like, like, oh, you motherfucker. It just starts running at us. It's like, okay, okay, I'm just fine, I'm just fine, I'm just fine. It's like, don't hit me again, Charles. Uh. So... 
that, that's a, that's a different movie. So this movie, <laughs> he's a bum going from town to town during the Great Depression. And uh, Speed, played by James Corbin, he has a guy. He has um, what looks Poe. like. Oh no, not well. He's not Poe yet. Poe wasn't there in that scene. He has. Oh, oh, uh, oh yeah, the fir- the first guy. Yeah, you're right. The first guy who looks like um, John C. Riley if he worked out <laughs> is in the middle of like a fist fight, and you know we've got all these guys betting. He just lost a bunch of money. He's like, God damn it. Then Charles Bronson comes in, and he's like. You know what? I could uh, make some money for you or whatever. He's like, I don't, I don't need your money. He's like, I got six bucks. All I have. Yeah, I just need you to get in there and make the trade or whatever. So then he's like, okay. So no, no loss either way for James Corbin. So they go in there, and he knocks the fuck out of this guy. And the next day, I think it's like one and, punch too, isn't it? Yeah, and he's like, shit. Okay, and he suddenly wants to become best friends with him. And they're on the train, and he gets there. He's like, we're gonna make tons of money. I tell you what, kid, we're gonna make lots of. Money. I don't know if he ever calls him kid. But he's like, we're gonna make plenty of money. You just wait, just you wait and see. And then. Once he gets there, he's like, just follow with me. This is my wife. Ain't she awesome? Or my forever fiance. And then he's all like, uh, uh, I might. Like, whoa, whoa what do you mean? You just can't go. He's just like, I want to just browse around the city first. And they're like, well, I see you again. Uh, you might. <laughs> Charles Bronson really is like the ultimate definition of freedom in this movie. Like there is, I've, I've never seen more freedom in a man than his character in this film. You know what I mean? Like literally he's not tied down by anything. He creates his own rules you know, like, but he's got all the skills he needs to survive. Like, there is nothing holding him back. Like, there's no such thing as a bad day in this guy's life. And he's a bum in the Depression. But everything sort of works out. Yeah, well, when they first, because, you know, then just shows him going around from at the town for a little while. He bumps shoulders with some girl who he sees at a cafe. And it's one of those things, just one of those really just the I can't find I just can't help but find it funny when he meets that one girl and she, they just there's like really nothing there at all between the two of them other than like snide remarks she's like what are you doing here waiting for someone to buy me coffee he just slides his coffee over you want me to walk you home i don't know do you just, just like that kind of shit like there's no nice interaction they're walking back she's like i'm gonna come in no maybe another time i have a i have a husband in jail he's like well, I'm sure he's not coming out anytime soon or some, some shit like that. And, and it's just like, so, and it's just like, oh, okay, don't want to come in. Oh, that's okay. I'll go walk the streets. It's just like, yeah, it's, I mean, like there's no, no for me. There's like no conflict or anything like that. It's just very like smooth and just like question. It's like, there, it's almost like there's no like beating around the bush. They're just straight questions. All straight, straight questions straight with questions. no real answers. <laughs> no real answers. That's totally true. But within those no an- without those answers, they still kind of answer the question in some other way. And there's a part when I guess you'd say they're in the full swing of your relation of their relationship, if you want to call it that. They're just sitting at a. Everyone else is dancing. They are literally just sitting at the table, just looking at each other, <laughs> drinking, not saying anything. Yeah, and you know what the fun thing is? Is that Charles Bronson's wife in real life? So I just picture that as like what. <laughs> <laughs> that's like autobiographical that's how they really met <laughs> like it's like the kind of people that get along really well but you really can't tell that they're even close to a relationship they don't even know what it really is well it's one of those things it's not like you know it's like you're having dinner with a group of friends and one couple kind of has like a small fight in front of you it just gets kind of awkward for a minute it's like they don't even have that. You think it's about to happen, but then they just both just kind of stare at each other. Like one of them will say something, other says something back in a snappy way. You're like, oh shit, no, 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 no. And they just kind of like just stand there quietly staring at each other. <laughs> so, anybody see that new movie? <laughs> yeah, just one of those ones where it's just like, it, it all works out still, oddly enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but well, it been for you folks? Oh, they've been together for like 50 years. Really? Shit. I think they're. I thought they're plotting to kill each other. That's a slow burn. You know what's the weird thing, though? I want to say this before we go any farther. Like, for the longest time, I thought this movie was a prison movie. Like, I, I thought it was literally a movie where, like, Charles Bronson... Was, I, I knew there was fist fighting in it, but I, I literally thought it was, like, a lockup film where it's like, he's in prison, and he's got to... This is what they do to pass the time in, like, the 30s. I, and it's like, oh, that's that's not what the movie is at all. There's, there's no prison at all in this film. I don't know why, yeah. but for the longest time, I thought it was a prison movie this whole time. I honestly went into this not really knowing what I was watching for a minute. I remember hearing about it and then kind of forgetting, oh, it's, I know it's a movie about boxing, but I don't remember who's in it, but I know someone big I like is in it. I don't remember who. I'm like, oh, yeah, right, it's this movie. 
Well, I think that's like almost the best way to go into a film is like the less you know about a movie, like all, all you need to know is like pretty much how I feel like the poster should describe anything you need to know about the movie. Like you don't need to know any more than that. No descriptions, no nothing. It's just best to go into a film by that and that alone. Mm -hmm. And this is also an example of um, character development for Charles Bronson because this is the kind of the character he always plays. Just kind of the guy who walks into the room doesn't really have a whole lot of flaws. I think the most flaws he's ever had is when he's like the Russian guy in The Great Escape. Beyond that, he's always just, you know, playing himself, which is fine because I like that character. Every so often you get people complaining, oh, he's only playing himself. I'm like, no, that's fine. I think that's why I like Clint Eastwood. I like that. I like the character he plays a lot of the times. So after that, he eventually goes back and knocks on James Corbin's door and you see his apartment and you see that it probably, it's not that it's a bad or ugly looking apartment but you could see they had to sell off a lot of their stuff it's very barren you know they got a table and they got a bed that's about it though and um he comes in his wife is passed out and he's like give what takes to get some what takes to get some breakfast woman come on get up get up get up we got a gas to you that was like a blanket over her <laughs> and then he's just like come in right this way and he, they start talking and james corbin's trying to act like what's interesting about his character he by all means is not a likable character but mm. the way how he plays him He's not, you don't hate him. You don't dislike him, but he has no real major likable qualities. He's a guy who acts like all the cards are on his, are on, are in his favor, but he doesn't even have a hand. Yeah. And he's just one of those guys who's really like, is, he's really probably poor almost than Charles Bronson, but he acts like he's like one of the rich guys in the neighborhood, though he really isn't at the end of the day. He's just a guy who's like right on the razor's edge of like being completely broke and being super homeless and being like, you know, thrown in jail or murdered by like mobsters. And he has in some way less freedom than Bronson. Yeah, he's he's tied down by a lot because well he's got he's got problems you know he's an alcoholic he's got gambling issues and he's always tied up in the mob because he likes to you know borrow from loan sharks but then has a hard time paying it back or doesn't pay it back or always you know he's always got the excuse and then he, at some point he's like all right well this is how we're gonna run it like, okay Cheney that's his name Cheney he's like we're gonna do it like this I get this percentage you get that percentage he's like. I don't think I need that. I think I uh, we're not we're in a different uh, sit, city now, so we can play differently. And he's like, no, no, that's how we do it. Like, oh, this is goodbye then. He's like, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up. Okay, we'll play your game then. And he says, well, first we're gonna need somebody. We're gonna need a doctor for you. And they go after this guy named Poe, played by uh, Storler Martin. And he's an interesting character because it's one of those things. They first they walk into a black church. And he's there's the a... one white guy in there. I'm like, I wonder who they're going to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> they go in, and the guy seems a little dazed. He seems like a little kind of even creepy. He's like, hey, how's it going? You find out the reason why he's going to the church. He's like, so are you a man of God? Like, oh, not really. He's just like, the he, reason he's going there. And this is the kind of shit you can get away with back in 1975. when we make these kind of movies. About a movie in the 1930s. Like, <laughs> about the 1930s. <laughs> He's just hanging out there. The reason he's going to the black church is because he's 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 like, oh, I got a I got a better chance of scoring drugs over here because you find out the guy's like an opium addict or something like that. And he's going to like a Chinese like Buddhist temple or something because of that. But I guess well, it's New Orleans, so <laughs> so you're not gonna find a China Chinese place there. It's like Probably I feel like not. he's going to like you know I mean like you just never hear of like you know, like there's a black guy on the street selling opium. You know what I mean? Never hear that too much. But I think he's just. Uh, <laughs> I think he's like, Leroy knows a guy who knows a guy kind of thing, but I don't know. Um, he goes there, and he's first off like, well, I'm not sure if I want to take the job, but let me get a look at Charles Bronson. And it's all the small little things. He's like, okay, well, he's got wide fingers. Those are harder to break. His thin is, his skin is thick right here. He's got strong, I'm guessing that's strong cartilage. Touches part of his face. He says, even thicker skin up here. I'm guessing you're not what we call a bleeder, are you? And... He, he's this guy who's kind of dazed and even especially when he's talking to that one girl at that one scene really fucking creepy but <laughs> that's the thing about this movie like there's a lot of characters in this movie who don't seem to be that like have that many redeeming qualities to them but the way they play them make them like you know what I could actually hang out with this guy a little while longer he's not super hateable and if they are hateable 
something bad is waiting for him right around the corner. Well, and really, Poe's not really a bad guy. He's actually a pretty nice fella overall. He just reminds me of like one of those guys who just probably, he just has his drug problem, which could probably get annoying at some point. But for the most part, <laughs> he, he just seems friendly and generally offering, and he's not trying to, where Speed's a little bit more shystery. That's the thing about him. Yeah. I mean, like, even, I feel like Speed would, I feel like Speed's like the great great grandfather, one of the kids from Ed, Ed, and Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly like you don't know what he's gonna do to try to con someone over and it even gets to the point too where it's like they get to like i think it's like the second fight they do where um they go to fight like i guess you know you could say like the main villain guy of the town who's really not a bad guy he's just a businessman but this guy who owns like an oyster factory or whatever and he's got his top dog guy fighter who's just, just like shaved head looking almost looks like fucking what's his name from like smashing pumpkins if he was buff um, Billy Corgan, Billy Corgan. If he worked out. <laughs> yeah, Billy Corgan, if he just ate oysters all day long and fought in the streets. <laughs> and, like, lifted, like, fucking barrels of beer for, like, <laughs> be- like just bench press those or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, actually, I think that might be his third fight, because I want to say, isn't his second fight, when they go, the one guy is, like, to promote the fight, he puts on, like, a, uh, like, a big, like, kind of crab, uh, crab oh, festival. Oh, when, when they go to, like, beer. the Cajun, I forgot, there's the Cajun guys. They, yeah, he goes to that guy first. And I just want to clarify, I don't think Poe's a bad guy. I don't I don't dislike him, but he just comes across as creepy at some points, but it's all because of his drug habit. So yeah. I think it's just one of those weird situations. Well, he, so he's, he's just actually like a fat pretty, guy in a suit and he's just like, I got my nice southern voice. How you doing there? Mr. How you doing? I got the blood of Edgar Allan Poe running right through me. Y'all like poetry? You want to feel <laughs> yeah, it? Like, <laughs> just like starts wrapping up, rub his veins like, yeah, feel Edgar. Touch him. Touch him <laughs> deep. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure if that scene went on a little longer, we'd see that. But, um, so what ends up happening is they go to this uh, big Cajun uh, festival, and this guy, this other fight promoter, he just has, like, all right, yeah, well, I put on, I got this, you know, got this us cooking crawdads and crabs. We got beer. We got music. It's all to help promote this fight. Let's get this going. You said this guy's green. This guy's a new guy. Let's fucking do this. This would be an awesome time. And Bronson beats this guy down pretty easily. Yeah. And then he goes up to the guy. He's like, oh, well, uh, here's the thing about that. Uh, you told me the guy was green. I'm like, he is green. It's only his third fight. I'm like, yeah, well, green usually means you got to lose. And I put on a lot. You could see I've made a big deal for this. So uh, maybe next time. And then, you know, that's where they take Bronson's the money. just calm. Yeah, Bronson's just really calm. Just like, <laughs> like. Uh, I guess we should get going. In like speed, James Corbin's character, like, no, no, you listen here, you son of a bitch. That's my money. I tell you, that's my money because we won that money, fair and square. And why, you know? And then all of a sudden, one guy's pulling out a gun. Oh, my one weakness. And they get in the car, they drive away. And she, like, that's the thing about like Charles Bronson. I wonder if he like, if they just wrote this for him to be the ultimate badass, and he's all like, you know what? This is what I would do. And um, <laughs> this scene's awesome. This is going on. <laughs> he's just like. Before we go to the city, let me take some of the more scenic routes. Like, what What do you mean, scenic routes? He says, like, I'm just curious to know. It's all business related. And then there's some, like, you know, bar they come across later at night. You see that whole gang there just, you know, shooting pool, bullshitting. And um, Charles Bronson walks in there, sees the guy with the gun, beats the fuck out of him. Takes the gun. Well, they take the one gun away. <laughs> That's what's the funny part. It's like there's like one gun. It's like, oh god, our one gun. We had to shell together the to get Depression. that singular gun. <laughs> yeah. It's the Great Depression. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it. it's like that one gun is gone, and it's just like whoop. And it's like from there, it's just this part's just badass. Where it's like Charles Bronson just like fucking beats the guys in there and everything like that. Gets the money back from him and everything like that. Tells him not to do that again. And then he's just walking out. He takes that gun. And it's got like eight rounds in it. And he just starts unloading in the bar. And he shoots like everything that's kind of important to him. He shoots like the mirror. He shoots the glass. He shoots the jukebox. You know, he shoots, you know, a couple other things in there. And then just drops the gun and fucking walks out. And shoots the phone so they don't like oh, yeah, the nobody. Phone. Yeah, it's like all, the- all the important things to a 1930s person. <laughs> Well, it's also funny because he just walks up to the guy with the point. He points to the, to the main guy, to the main uh, main boss. He says, "Like, I got a feeling you don't want to shoot me." He says, "Like, I don't want to shoot you, but I do want to use it." And just like pistol whips him, <laughs> and he goes down. He says, "Like, I give me the money." He just don't like give him the money. He says, "Like, there's more than one way to use this thing." <laughs> he just gives him the money, takes it, just chucks the wallet. 
And then, like, you know, they just get out. They're hitting it. Like, you know, you, like you said, he unloads the gun, goes back out there to um, James Corburn and Poe. And, po, and they're just like, oh, my God, he did it. He did it. And then they get their big old score. And is this the part where, like, James Corbin goes and, like, blows his stash, like, right away by playing dice? I want to say he blows a big portion of it. I think that's maybe that's that the might, maybe that's the third fight that. then that might be the third fight because I want to say maybe that was right there no you're right no, it's gotta be the third fight because that's because we get the guys threatening him like we need your money now asshole yeah because because then he goes that and then he's like oh I'll get it back to you in two days or whatever he says or something like that and then they go and they do I think this is when they do like the the fight with the the guy who owns the oyster company and then, well, the, and then there's um God, isn't there another fight where they fight and fucking like in front of the boats where it look it's like literally like the Ken stage from Street Fighter Two? I would like to see a two D uh, a two D like you know nineties art like arcade like fighter game out of this. Well, the, this movie's initially called the Street Fighter, and they only changed it because the Sonny Chiba movie came out right beforehand. That makes sense. We'll even use the word Street Fighter a few times. You took my best Street Fighter. This really is like the, like it's like a prequel to Street Fighter Two or Street Fighter and Street Fighter Two. You know what I mean? Like before yeah, Ryu be and like, Ken, there was Charles Bronson. Well, this could be like Ken's dad or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's how he got all his money. <laughs> so uh, I became the masters. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, uh, what was I gonna say? They they have a part where they just go and there's the rich oyster guy and he's just putting on the fight. They're just watching and we see how badass uh, Buff Billy Corgan is just taking out all these guys. And he's just like, "I'll save that one for later," you know. And then they go do the second fight and then they do. That's where they do this. They get they they get threatened about how much they owe about how much uh, James Corburn on speed and. Then there, I think he has a couple, another moment or two with his, uh, I'm not sure, late, maybe the lady he's stalking, or I don't know what you call her, but the lady he just kind of like hangs around and stares at. And, <laughs> and she's just always kind of like, you just come when you want, you just go whenever you feel like it, you know, if you get bored, you go somewhere else, like, but then you hang out every once in a while, it's like, it's confusing. He just walks out the door mid-sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Just ultimate freedom. That's what I mean. There's more freedom in this character than any other character I've ever seen. Well, I'm, I guarantee if, like, you know, Tom Petty was around back then, he'd always be listening to Free Fallen. I'd be just like, this is my song right here. Yeah, it's just, there's, I, I, yeah, there's more, there's more freedom in here than a Rage Against the Machine song. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's just like i don't know what to say like i've never seen a guy with like more optimism and more like carefreeness is like nothing there's no such thing as a bad day in this guy's life and he's a fighter <laughs> so as that happens i want to say uh they're getting ready for the third fight and th this fight's a little bit more of um he takes a few more hits the guy stays up a little longer than usual but he eventually goes down fairly easily even though he gets a few swings in on Bronson. And then they get this. And the, the thing is, the guy who is uh, running it, there's like the evil oyster guy. He actually, the thing about him, he's one of those guys who he's clearly the villain of the movie, but he's not a hateable guy. He no. walks around like with a fur, with a coat, with a fur trim, and he tries to be all proper and all that. And there's a scene that comes later, but I think it kind of has a good, uh, says a lot about the character, where James Corbin says, no matter how nice you look or what you do, you always smell like oysters. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the guy's like, he was, he wants to be this guy of class and this guy of, you know, of, um, of high society. But it's like, <laughs> well, I'm just having people like break oysters over rocks. Yeah. You, you literally just have a blue collar like business. You know what I mean? Don't, don't try to sell yourself as this high and mighty guy that you aren't really. He's like, yeah, but I hang out at the men's club where, you know, we all get together and swim naked. <laughs> that part where it's like they just go and there's just those guys just standing around well then nobody's naked but you know yeah, that probably is what it is later on there's a couple guys in those old school like one piece like striped swimsuits <laughs> yeah jump in the pool and they're playing cards out you know poolside and so on like that and then they go and they have their they have the fight they win pretty easily and the guy's just like all right all right good job and that's where we have the scene where they're all playing the game. They're all they're all uh, playing cards, but he's uh, they're, they're all they're all at a club. Poe's getting a little kind of rapey towards one lady, and then <laughs> Bronson is just kind of staring at his lady, like just very awkwardly from a distance. And like 
want to go? Maybe. I don't know. And then <laughs> that's where Speed goes. Is like, well, let's make some more money. And like blows his entire cut on a game of dice. Yeah, not making it. Any- it was just, it was like fiance just sitting there watching and so on like that. And then it's like this is the part where it's like this is the one part where Speed becomes kind of like the bad guy because then he goes back to like Charles Bronson. He's like, well, you know, if anything, you owe me money. You know, it's not my fault I lost some money. You know what? You should. How about you give me some of your cash? How much you got there? And he's like. Nah, I guess this is just where we have to part ways. Like, no, no, no. We need more money, damn it. Where are you going? You can't get out of here now. Come on. What about me? What think about, about me? Think about me. I'm so awesome. It's like, that was my money we put down at first. You know, that was my, you know, my trade, my, you know, connections and so on. This movie, it really kind of says, like, why do you need the middleman? Yeah, because it's kind of like clearly, I mean, like, I guess like at first just to get into the game, but it's almost like as it goes on, you don't really need to so much. And there's even another scene, too, where it's like, I think this comes a little bit before this part, but um, they go to the the oyster guy or whatever. The oyster guy's like, hey, I want to buy your fighter. And he's like, he's talking to Speed and Charles Bronson goes, no, if you want to, you talk to me if you want to do this. You don't talk to him. And so (laughs) I like that. And Speed even has this look like the fuck. (laughs) He's like, he's like, I want to buy you. No deal. (laughs) <laughs> Charles Bronson's got ultimate freedom. He's not owned. He's not a slave. <laughs> He's his own Free man, damn. Fallen. Just like as he walks in the room, the song plays, as he leaves. You hear kind of fade, like, oh, he takes that song with him wherever he goes. Well, at the end the point where he's like, he's like, well, what, what are you doing? Like, where you get all that cash? He's like, I just need a certain amount of cash and then I'm out of here. That's it. Somewhere oh, new. Yeah. Well, I think that Speed's realizing that he just had, like, uh, Speed's realizing that he had a, uh, Sorry, if I was going off, I had to turn it off. Speed realized that he is not really needed. He kind of relies more on other people. And he doesn't really want to admit it. He wants to think that he's the reason why everything's working out, but not the case whatsoever. He's more hes more of a hindrance to himself and everybody else around him. But regardless, I mean, James Corburn, the way they write him, even though he's not really a great guy, he's not so bad that you hate him. Yeah, he's just a guy who has problems. That's pretty much it at the end of the day, you know? Mm-hmm. and uh then at some point he just like goes hey, i'm not this part <laughs> i misheard it at first i thought that was one of the funniest things but then i'm like oh i misheard that that would have been so great if they did that he at some point he goes to a brothel to kind of like you know fuck away his problems he picks out this one girl then we cut to later after they're done fucking they're laying in bed he says what's your name i thought she said kim he says well carol <laughs> 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 no, she says she says her name's Carol, but it just it's just hard to hear. Like, oh my god. <laughs> well, there's that part too when it lay there. It's like he's like, well, what'd you think of that? And then she says, like, oh, you know, you were fantastic. Thought you'd say that. And I just thought that was just kind of funny. Just like he's like, yep, you're you're just playing it, whatever. But like, I think that goes to show that's just like all the problems that you know the James Corbin character has. He's like a gambler, you know. He's an alcoholic. You know, Persist. yeah, you know, just so much problems that he sort of has, you know, where Poe just has like, you know, he's just the the sort of happy, happy, high, rapey fella who's a little bit overweight. I guess you could say he has problems because Char- really the only person that doesn't have any problems is Charles Bronson. <laughs> Though his wife is or his fiance, forever fiance, is just kind of there and just kind of hangs out like you fucked it up again. Yeah, exactly. He's just he's just there likes to be like sort of it. Like if he didn't have her, he would be super unstable probably. God he knows needs- where. Like he's already off the rails, but he would be off the rails in the ditch without her. Yeah, she somehow kind of keeps him going and even though he's like, "Woman, where's my breakfast?" Yeah. What's a man got to do to get breakfast around here, goddamn it. <laughs> so, uh shortly after that, not too long after that, what ends up happening is um the mafia guys come in. They're just like, all right, well, uh, where's your money? Like, oh, you know me. I'm good for it. I'm good for it. Yeah, you've been saying that. But uh, here's the thing. We're gonna we're getting tired of waiting. And within that, what ends up happening is the oyster guy comes in and says, look, I have a score to settle with you. So what I did is I paid them to keep them off your back just a little bit longer. And I want a second shot at fighting your guy. Like, really? Like, yeah, yeah. Like, it's more about pride for him than it is money. Mm-hmm. And I kind of like, because because uh, Cheney, uh, the Charles Bronson character, has no reason to stay there, has no reason to keep going, but ends up saying, like, you know what? Because, like, Poe comes to him and says, like, 
he really needs you. You're the only one that could save him. He's just like, well, sounds like he's pretty fucked and on his own, you know. As time goes on, though, he's just like, at the last minute, he has like, well, I, uh, he's just a good guy. He owes him not a goddamn thing, but comes back. He says like, all right, yeah, I'll fight <laughs> you. I'll fight you. But there's a scene I really like within that. Because like, all right, well, you can't you you're gonna let you we're not we're gonna keep them from killing you for a little while longer but we're gonna hold on to you just to make sure that you don't leave town or something and i like that they're playing cards with a couple of he's playing cards with a couple of thugs and then there's the guy a buff billy corgan yeah that uh charles bronson beat and he's all saying like so which one of you is going to do him in if he doesn't show up tomorrow he's like oh i guess we both will like and he's like, well, let me in, Adam. I can, bro- I can go for it. And he's like, oh, well, he's like, he's like well, I guess. And then, like, I think uh, James Corman says, well, I guess you even had a win in a while. So I can see why you want that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This guy- even when he's staring be- death down the barrel, he's still just kind of talking shit. Exactly. But then they bring in, like, the whole point is they bring this guy in from Chicago who's, like, actually, like, kind of, like, nicely dressed and everything. Almost doesn't even look like a fighter at first. You just look at him like a businessman. I even like when he gets off the train and everything with, like, the oyster guy standing there and the Billy Corrigan guy. And he, like, just hands the bags to Billy Corrigan. And he just looks, he's like, I don't do that. With a big smile on his face. And just, like, the guy, (laughs) he just has his hand out the bag. And then the oyster man's like, no, no, you take the the bags. Just just do it. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like... (laughs) Well, that guy, when he comes in, uh, I, he, and not, it wasn't one of those things that took me out of the movie, but when he comes in, he's wearing that like leather jacket that has that weird kind of, I don't know what you call it. A lot of like old Civil War uniforms had it, where it's, or, or even like, I'm going to say Luke Skywalker's outfit in Return of the Jedi had it, where it's like that part that buttons down from more of like almost from the other side of your chest. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, it crosses over. Yeah, one of those kind of jackets. He's wearing like a jacket kind of like that. I know that. I'm sure that thing had to exist back then, but the way how his hair was slicked back and he was wearing that, I almost thought he came across as almost kind of like a villain out of an '80s movie. Huh? When he like when the the, the battle at the end, when he's coming down because he has his hair stripped back for whatever reason, he was reminding me of William Defoe from Streets of Fire. He had a little bit of that. You know what he also reminded me of is a uh, what's his name from Django Unchained. Uh, just like a, it looked, he looked like a younger version of um oh the, um. The German guy, guy, I'm blanking on his name right now. Oh, um, 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 the actor. Um, I forgot the name of the actor, but um, shit, yeah, I can't think. Schultz, Schultz. The character's name was Schultz. Yeah, he, like when I looked at him, I'm like, oh my god, that almost. I'm like, it can't be him, just because of how old this movie is. But it's like, boy, does that look like him. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that guy's a big. I'm trying to blank on his name, but yeah, that dude, Christoph Waltz. That's it. There we go. Yeah. Now, I didn't think of it at the time, but now you mention it, yeah, it does sound kind of like Yeah, him. he had a look of him and everything like that. And I was just like, even even when I was watching the credits, I'm like, I, I can't be him, but let me just see. It's like, oh, no, it's not him. I'm like, just trying to, I was, I was like timing it and go, well, if he was maybe like 22 and he just happened to, you know, it's, it's the 70s, so you can look like you're like 35. <laughs> yeah. How old, how old are you? You're, you look like you're uh, 36. Well, I'm 21. Yeah, exactly. Like one well, of those ones. But, um... But yeah, and that kind of was like, <clears throat> so Charles Bronson shows up to save the day. Once again, doesn't have to whatsoever, but it's just the kind of guy he is. He's the, he's the do the right thing kind of fella. He comes in, they do their fight. Well, I like how Poe's like, go get him. I'm going to Poe's like, no, I'll get him. Grabs a wrench, just throws it through the fucking window. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, well, a- I guess they're here. <laughs> I don't know what that was. That was like some pent up rage. You know what? Fuck that guy. I'm going to throw this wrench right through the window. He's like, oh, he is a very kind of dainty southern. One of those, he's like one of those very dainty southern kind of guys. Like, oh my lord, well I do oppose the side of violence. Like, this is my one outlet. Fuck you. Uh. <laughs> yeah, just like throws it, just goes like two feet, just hits the side of the wall, bounces back, <laughs> smacks him in the face. <laughs> uh, well, uh, how about you just go up there and knock on that door then? Looks like the doctor needs his own doctor. All hands on the <laughs> G.I. Joe cartoon. He, he's just like rubbing his head like, oh, I could go for some lemonade right now. <laughs> that dude's in the wrong spot. Cause he's in the, he's with a bunch of men's, like men, a uh, man's man. Ah, man. Man's man's man. man. Yeah. You could almost have that theme song from South Park. The man time. You could almost have that plane drop. <laughs> like, movie. what makes man is it the one by his side? No, probably them titties. Yes. Now you're a man. 
man, 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 man. That's the thing, guys. Like, these are the kind of things real. you watch. These kind of movies like this, and it's the perfect example. Is like I don't know what it is. I don't know if you've noticed, but if you look at children nowadays, you ever just feel like, and maybe this is how like every like adult looks at children at some point, where you go, "Damn, the children really look like a bunch of fucking wussies." Like, like where's that? Like you just don't see like that manly child walking around. They're, just, they're always just like, "Whoa, boyish," you know, arms flailing and everything like that with stupid fucking hair and like dumb looking t-shirts and so on on but i think that's probably what every generation always you just get to a certain age and you just look at the youth and you're just like god they look fucking stupid <laughs> i think it is i think one of the things that it's like one of when I, part of me gets it to some extent like parent, parents want their kids to be good looking so they can get a girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever the fuck but when i see some like little like pimple faced like 12 year old and they got his hair all jailed back and they're trying to get making give him a night like and they give and he has braces like you're not fucking fooling anybody well it's not even that kid it's like it's more just like just i don't know what it is it's just like the kids just look weak nowadays like they look frail like if you send them off the war we're definitely gonna lose that's all i think about <laughs> <laughs> so you you want the you so you're you're trying to do like the thing from the Tekken anime where you like we need to push them off a cliff. <laughs> I don't know. That's how the lions raise their young. The ones that climb up get to earn the privilege of life and dinner. I, I don't know what it is. I I do have this feeling like we just need a little bit more like violence in like our culture. Like I don't know what it is. Like we just need like some martial arts training just to kind of like some Spartan training maybe. Maybe not that extreme, but you know what I mean. I don't know what it is. I just feel like there's something missing. You know. I think it all comes in waves. I think what's gonna happen is we're at the point. Our generation was sort of that middle point between oh Billy goes out, he plays sports, he's in karate, he skateboards, he rollerblades, he you know all that stuff. Play, rides a bike. I guess that's true because we're from the extreme sports generation. It's weird to think, but that's what we were. We were the generation where you like you skateboard or you did karate or you mountain climb. Like nobody really did like a normal sport. It was all that stuff. But now I think we're at this point where it's just like I don't know what it is. It's just maybe it's I don't know. You just just you look at like the majority of kids and it's just like where where where's like the one? It's like I don't know. It's, just, it's something's missing. I, I don't know. I, like I said, I think it comes in waves. And I think that now you got these studies about like people playing football for long terms of time grow up to have fucking brain damage. So I think that kind of shit scares people off. So and I, when you look long enough, you'll see kids in sports and all that. Some of my nephews yeah. are in sports. But I think that it's just one of those things like, eh, you know, society's easier. And back when this movie was made, I mean, <laughs> that was like, well, first off, when this movie was made combined with when the movie takes place. It's this weird combination of like, yeah, you had to be tough. You had to be stronger. You had, and even like, I mean, even up to like through the seventies and a little bit of the eighties, they were still reaching that point. Actors were reaching this point of like, well, where, where are we going to get a guy who, um, we need a guy who looks like he works at a factory. How, how are we going to get this actor? Just go to the fucking factory. Ask them if they want a new job. <laughs> really? Yeah. Now it's just kind of like we got method actors. Like, I spent some time at a factory and learned the lingo of these uh, blue collar people, you know, so, and, you know, you still find some people, you know, actors that work their way up. But at the same time, I think you, there's a lot more of this back then. I think so. so. It shows it's a lot, it comes off, it comes off a lot more <clears throat> authentic. I think when we had Wes on talking about the getaway, I, I'm not sure if it was him that brought it up, but I think he may have brought it up that like, yeah, something about Steve McQueen, a lot of the other people in this movie, they just seem like, they just got out of like, you know, pulling like a bank heist somewhere that they were just doing like some minimum wage job and just came in and did this movie. And I think that's true. It's like, cause that, that's what I always feel. This is what I love about old movies and stuff like that is there's always like a more real feel to it. Like movies nowadays. I mean, like, you know, you grant, you could say movies have always been fake, but I feel movies used to be kind of like real. And it was just more like there was a story written around real people kind of doing stuff. You know what I mean? You know, think about like in the olden days where like Errol Flynn did like lots of his own stunts or, you know, just different films where people were like, you know, when something exploded, something exploded. You know, when something was built, something was built and so on. When a man was tough, a man was tough. You know what I mean? Where I feel like now it's like almost like things are kind of just created and built like just to have the look and the appeal. But it's almost like the feeling's not there anymore. I feel like that's kind of like the loss to like a lot of things is. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you look at Charles Bronson, you could tell that's a tough guy. You know what I mean? There is nothing, mm -hmm. like, feels fake about that guy right there. You could say the same thing yeah. with Clint Eastwood and so on, and even John Wayne and things like that. And it's just to the point now of, like, 
I don't know. Maybe that's just one of those ones. Like, you know, you know for a fact that, like, our grandparents, you know, World War II generation probably looked at us in the fucking 90s just like, what the fuck's wrong with them? What the hell's wrong with these what's this? What's, what's these bullies playing with the Japanese toys called the Pokemans? <laughs> didn't we fight a war to make we Didn't we drop two bombs to make sure this didn't happen? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to drop two more. I'm tired of hearing them talking about these Pika Wuts and Charmanders. Believe me, when I was over in Japan, that's all I heard was Pika Wuts and Charmanders. And we, we put a stop to it, damn it. We thought we took out the whole factory. <laughs> they were plotting it. We heard that the ca- we, we heard that the that, that Nagasaki was holding Nintendo, and we were going to stop it at the source before it grew. <laughs> we didn't realize they had a second answer. one. <laughs> like a secret sale, they got they started spreading America. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, granted, I think to do like a Tom Clancy novel. I think no matter what, that's just always how it is. I think this like generation after generation looks down on you. Know there probably was like some generate like. Generation before World War II that looked at them and like, bunch of World War II fucking pussies. You know what? Fucking fighting in the Spanish-American War. God damn it, that was where it was at. <laughs> or even have, like, just World War One. like, oh, you got your nice automatics. Yeah, well, we were in a fucking ditch in the mud for days. With fucking no mustard gas like- going over. You know what? If you breathed a little bit of it in each day, you got immune to it. That was like how you did. That's how you got you to get used to this shit. And literally, we were standing in shit because everybody was shitting in the fucking trenches. It's goddamn fucking terrible. Oh, look at you, look at... They literally outlawed three-bladed knives for your World War II battles. Because you know what? It was too hard to sew up. Not World War I. You got impaled with that shit. You fucking just burnt it. And you kept going on and kept fighting. So that's what you did. Back in World War One, they didn't take no prisoners. They just fucking shot you. World War Two, a German caught you. Guess what? You get to go play baseball. Oh, good for you. You got a day off. Yeah, they hand you fucking chocolate bars and they give you all this fucking free time to build a great escape. <laughs> is that is all that true, or are they just being the nicest camp possible and like the Great Escape? Well, I think sadly enough, I think if you were like an American prisoner or a British prisoner in a Nazi camp. It wasn't really, like, the worst thing. You know what I mean? You're not Jewish, so it's it's kind of like a step up. You know what I mean? It's, it's like being in prison and kind of being, like, in a, like, a minimum security one <laughs> compared to being in maximum security, which would be, like, being in the like Jewish you camp. In, you got, like, in there for, like, tax fraud or something? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was sort of what it was like. You know what I mean? So... So no matter what, I think it always is. There's always, like, the previous generation that's always, like, looking down upon the youth. I just imagine them just watching all these Americans play b- baseball, like, Are you Yankees playing nice? Yes, Mr. Hans. Okay, <laughs> you keep doing that. That's very good. And we will have American chocolate bars for you later on. Ooh! <laughs> Only for the teams that wins. <laughs> yes, we don't like to support losers. That is not the German way. <laughs> As you were. It takes off as a, like, golf cart. <laughs> <laughs> German ingenuity. <PR> <laughs> Believe me, everyone is going to want to have one of these electric motor cars. I call it a golf wagon. <laughs> oh, it is so funny. <laughs> I made up another funny. <laughs> So, back to this movie. Back to the ending fight here of, like, what it's like to be a man in the 30s in New Orleans. And, like, and like um, so Bronson and this dude go at it, and it's a pretty good fight. It's actually uh, really, you know, just a lot of heart. It's a really hard-hitting fight, and Bronson has a little bit more trouble on this one. There is no moment where it seems like he's on the ropes too much. But this one, he's a little closer than he would have been, but he still manages to beat this guy down. And there's another moment it's where uh, I, this one makes the uh, last fighter kind of a little bit more likable than other fighters. At some point, the uh, Oyster Man, he's getting desperate. He's just like, beat him, beat him. And he drops down like two iron rods. He's like, grab those. He like looks at him and he's like, he just like slaps him aside, like, no, I'm gonna fight him, like, I'm gonna fight him with my fist. That's how we do it here. Yeah, we ain't cheating. I like how it's like it's like blatantly too. It's like just like there. It's just like he's just not gonna give up. He just does not want to lose to the point where like James Corbin's like, tactical foul, tactical foul. <laughs> <laughs> What's a tactical foul? <laughs> And then the fight kind of keeps going on. And once again, like, Charles Bronson's definitely winning here. But that, 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 at least the other guy from Chicago wants to go down, like, like a man. 
So he, he takes mm-hmm. those blows, and Charles Bronson just keeps knocking him back, knocking him back, knocking him back, until he finally, like, hits the car and slowly slumps down. I don't know if they said this, but if the, either way, I think they should have... Um, I didn't get it if they did. I think it would have been a good idea if he was, like, a professional boxer, like, who's has, who has it all from, like, Chicago. The uh, guy from Chicago? Yeah, yeah. I think it would have been good if he was, like, a professional boxer. So it's just, like, the fact that they're, like, we're bringing in a special... Rather than just, like, another street fighter, kind of like, oh, you know, this is a high-class guy. Yeah. And, then, like, you know, a lot of things that, once again, in this movie, like, are not really explained. It's just kind of, like... He shows up. There's no backstory to him whatsoever. You know what I mean? But almost kind of cool in a way because it's just different. It's like something you would never get in movies nowadays because nowadays everybody's got to have a backstory and an origin story and like things have to be really well explained. But in the olden days, sometimes you just didn't have to explain things nearly as much. You just let them kind of play out almost. And I kind of like that. Yeah, there's a lot more vague and they never really even explain Charles Corbin's or, or, or um. Bro, uh, Charles Bronx, Charles Corbin's, uh, Charles Bronson's whole backstory too much. So he just kind of let you figure it out. Yeah. So, and he's leaving town. He at some point he bought a cat. And he just says the post he's like, "You take care of my cat for me." Don't and smoke then it. After he, yeah. <laughs> Don't smoke my cat. Here, here's two. <laughs> just see him just rolling it up into a joint. Like, ah! <laughs> shh, 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 pussy. You be quiet now. Just, just, ah! just go along with it. <laughs> You're gonna smoke this cat. <laughs> <laughs> got to smoke something. <laughs> no, but um, <laughs> just don't ask me why. That's just funny. To me. But um, but uh, <laughs> just imagine this fucking joint <laughs> with the cat head, head sticking out, sticking out. <laughs> and the tail just like <laughs> trying to light it. <laughs> so fucking stupid. <laughs> Even though I guess anyway. I guess he could be huffing the cat pee too. That's probably what he would be doing. Yes, he'd be cheesing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like having a piss in his face, like in South Park. <laughs> no, um, he's at the church, so after- just fucking like they're all like fucking dancing, fucking carrying the cat, cheesing. <laughs> <laughs> so what ends up happening is he they fight and he ends up uh, he ends up winning, of course. And this goes back to one of those things where. After the fight, he looks over at like with the mobsters who are holding James Corbin. They give him a nod, like, "All right, nice work." He's like, "He's like, you owe, you, like, he owes you the money." He's like, "All right, very good." And then even the oyster man walks up to him, and it's like he's a little frustrated, but at the same time, he's like, "Hey, you beat me fair and square." And that's where James Corbin says, "Like, it's like your mama. It's like mom. It's like our mama always used to say." And they even finish each other's sentences right here. He says, "Like." Next best thing to playing and winning is playing and losing. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, see you around, see you around. <laughs> and then James, then, uh, then like they give uh, Charles Brunson a ride to the edge of town. He's just like, oh, well, where are you going to go now? I'm like, I guess wherever the wind takes me. going to travel the earth like Kung Fu, like, like what Kang, Kung Fu, you know, something like that. He's like, he's like, weird. He's like, he's like well, what direction are you going? Or it's like, it's like, well, where are you going? North. <laughs> like, that's just like, that's it. I pick a compass direction. That's all I need. I go wherever, wherever everything takes me. And that's where he gives Poe the money to go take care of his cat. And then he starts walking. And whenever he's leaving, they have this Western kind of song playing. It's kind of a cool song, too. I like that one a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like, you know, there was like the man that like that we were joking around. because we It was the first time we saw it Once Upon a Time in the West. And we're like, he keeps on playing that same song in the harmonica. Like, there's the man with no name. And there's, there's the man that knows one song. <laughs> yeah, the man with one song. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Bronson. So he's always he's walking away. They start to play this not that song, but it starts to play this very westernish song. And they're like, ah, oh, there he goes. Where are we off to now, Poe? He's like, oh I'm like, oh man, yeah, that sounds good. Let's go get the cat. Let's go get Don't the- smoke the fucking thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I can't remember what happens like the um, to the Charles Bronson girl. She just says something at one point where like. I can't remember, like, how that... I forgot how that was. She's, like... She says, like... Almost, like, leading, like, oh, there's another man. You know, he takes care of me. He knows what to do. He's got a steady job and everything like that. And then Charles Bronson's, like, really? <laughs> just, like, very, like, that. She's, like, yeah, no, that's not true. <laughs> I just kind of wanted to make that up. But I can't remember. Is that the last scene that they have of each other? I think it is. Just like, she's, like, I'm right moving up in the world or something like that. It's like, you take care. You got to do what you got to do. I think I think the whole thing we're trying to get with that, and I know people probably find this offensive today, but I think what they're trying to do with that is that she's a 
lady in a really regressive time. So it's kind of like only thing she really used to get by is her looks. And she has to be kind of sassy and be kind of hard to get across, you know, because she's just not going to fall with any guy. So to some extent, she is kind of a I think they're just trying to make her a gold digger because that's, I think, what I, was, I, mean, I mean, I'm just saying I think it's, it's the time movie takes place. I think that's what they're trying to go with. I don't think she was too much of a gold there because she did mention like lines like she's like when like Charles Bronson does like offer her like she's like, you know what? I want some new clothes. I want some food. I want, you know, some groceries and so on like that. And he whips out some money. He's like, I don't want you to have to give it to me. I want to earn it for myself. She does. Oh, that's She right. does have that I line. And <laughs> I, forgot that's Charles Bronson I forgot about that part. And walks out the door after that. <laughs> That's right. Okay, I totally forgot about that part. You're right. So I'm just thinking because she's talking about how she has a guy and she has a guy waiting for her in jail. And then she has like a scene. I remember saying, I want this, I want that. But I forgot the whole part where she said that I, I don't want you to get it for me. And then she has a, I have a guy waiting for me. You do? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think she was almost trying to make Charles Bronson jealous, but that doesn't work on Charles Bronson. He has too much freedom. <laughs> nothing ties him down <laughs> nothing ties him down you know what i mean he's just gonna he's just gonna leave no matter what <clears throat> he's just i think you're just trying to yeah i think it's just one of those things like oh it's hard times for everybody so unless you're charles bronson <laughs> unless charles bronson he just he just gets enough money to get by and just kind of wanders on yeah just every, everything sort of works out for charles bronson like and even like his fights i mean like i, I feel like there really is no struggle for him like you know what i mean like he could have taken on all four of those guys at once and still probably walked away really well <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he had he had a pretty good. He could have so. shot a Hadouken and just like <laughs> Hadouken. <laughs> well, that, no, no, people like that's more like Clint Eastwood. Be like Hadouken. He has kind of like a he has like a kind of a. Let me tell you here. He has a little bit of that. Listen here, Shane. He has a little bit of that. Not too much of it, but just a little bit of that without the Shane kind of part to it. Yeah. Well, it's just like too. It's his like, voice is hard to mim- his voice is hard to mimic. I know, and it's like uh, the way I like about Charles Brown's character. I like how he like very rarely says much, but like almost gets across like way more character in the process. What have him and Clint Eastwood ever been in a movie together? I don't think so. I can't think of any. It's so weird that they never. They should have had like the Clint Eastwood versus Charles Bronson movie. That's like something that would have happened nowadays. Like if they're, you know, I mean, if you could, because like nowadays, I think people are finally starting to do those type of movies. But back then, it looked like the Batman v Superman like cover. Yeah, because you know, I mean, like think about like think how long it took Arnold Schwarzenegger and Stallone to be in the same movie. You know, what I mean, that didn't even happen yeah. until the very end. I just think in the olden days, you generally it was kind of rare to find like two big actors in one movie like that that was was probably it was probably like too much probably too expensive to get them both well i think there there was like a price difference back then too that like made it kind of hard to do and i think also it was just because you know like you think about a lot of clint eastwood movies it's like clint eastwood's a star and then the rest of the actors in there aren't like really that big of names you know Mm -hmm. might have a couple character actors yeah television but yeah it's always Clint, it would always be like, here's the one big star. And they like, I want to say occasionally get some, I'm like Magnificent Seven. I'm not sure if that was like an all-star cast or if that was a bunch of those guys before they were big. Yeah. And then you have movies like that, which, yeah, I, I, once again, we're always kind of confused if that's the case. That that one, I guess, is probably a little bit more of an all-star cast, I think, at the time. And I don't think all the guys are super like huge yet, but it, they are kind of there. And I guess you could even say, like, How the West Was One has a little bit like that. But for the most part, it seems like a lot of movies are, like, your main character. Maybe you have an older actor in there, kind of like James Corbin, because, he's you know, he's the older guy in it. And I remember even he seemed like in in some of the things I read, he kind of was like, oh, what, Charles Bronson's build, you know, ahead of me? Like, what's with that? Well, mm. I could see, I just looked it up. Magnificent Seven is in, came out in <clears throat> 1960. So that's, uh, you know... 15 years before this um so i could see a lot of these people being like oh this guy's got the look i mean some of them are probably a yule brenner was the name they're using to sell it and steve mcqueen was probably up and coming and eli wallach coming off of i'm assuming this is uh after good bad and the ugly so no, that's way before it my, that's way before good bad and the ugly, good, bad, and the ugly is like 68 69. oh 1966 yeah good bad and the ugly is 66 oh, okay 66. so never mind yeah so it's one of those things where I know Eli Wallach was a character actor who did a lot of broad. It's it's funny because a lot of times it'd be either you're a guy that got straight off the fact, like straight off the factory and asked him if you want to shoot a gun on screen, or he was like a Broadway actor. Cause apparently there is the character Cheyenne from once upon a time in the West. And he was apparently some like old timey Broadway actor. And I was like, really that guy, he just seems so manly. Well, at that time period, though, like, see, the thing is, is Broadway used to be manly. There, oddly enough, there was a time period where 
singing and dancing was like a man thing to do. I think because it came from like sort of like post World War II. It's like we just did a bunch of killing, so let's have fun, you know. And it really, only as time has gone on, has Broadway kind of become like the gay thing, I guess you could say. Not like in a negative way, but you know what I mean? Like, that's kind of like what Broadway started known as. Where in the olden days, it wasn't that. That's it. it was kind of a manly thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I'm just speaking ahead of time here. I think we should do Once Upon a Time in the West at some point, because we are kind of going down. Like, it seems to be either like, you know, the Steve McQueen, Bronson kind of era of movies. Well, that'd and then, be a cool one anyways, because I haven't seen that movie in a long time, and that's a great film. And plus, that's also, it's also the first, as far as I know, I mean, I mean, good. people said Fistful of Dollars was kind of self-aware for the time, but it kind of also st- stopped and kind of changed them. Um, how do I put this? Like it was sort of self-aware of old Westerns at the time, but then it kind of also like became the new, um, new standard. Mm. But then this was also one of the first ones to really kind of flip a lot of shit on its back. Cause you know, they open up with all these big stars at the beginning and they all die really fucking quickly. So people are like, wait, what? Those guys are dead. And then you had, you know, you had a uh, Henry Fonda in there and Henry Fonda was always a good guy, and he looks like a good guy, but he is like a cold-blooded motherfucker in this movie. He's like, wait, wait, Henry Fonda's the bad guy? So to people, to a lot of people today, this would just look like a standard Western. But back then, it was like really taking the formula and flipping it on its back. Yeah, it was a very radical one. And plus, that's Sergio Leone's first time being like in America shooting a movie and so on, too. So it's kind of cool like that. But yeah, I, I've been thinking about that movie for a while. I'm like, man, that would be a fun one to watch again. So maybe that will have to be one we do. The cool thing about, like, Hard Times, though, it's also Walter Hill's first uh, directing movie. I saw that, yeah. This is almost becoming the Walter Hill cast. I know, we, we've done, what, we do three of them so far? Maybe only two. Well, we did, we did The Getaway. We did yeah. this. We did Streets of Fire. We uh, talked at length about Chick with a Dick. <laughs> yeah, and... the, the assignment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, it was brought up many times. Is. Like, shit, that, that's all I think about. It's like, when you're 80 years old, that's, that's what you want to make. Walter Hill, you're 80 years old. What kind of movie you want, man? Well, I always want to see Michelle Rodriguez with a cock that's twice the size of Marky Marks. Wait, what? <laughs> I didn't stutter, did I? Hey, who made 48 Hours? Uh, you did? Yeah, who made The Warriors? Uh, you did? Yeah, who produced all the fucking Alien movies? Uh, Walter, you did? Yeah. Chick with a dick. Fuck you. My new movie. <laughs> 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 All right, we'll do it. We owe him this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can't stop him now. You know what I mean? <laughs> Shit, that's originally what Bullet to the Head was, but they said we should get Stallone. And I'm like, well, can we give him a vag? No, Walter, we can't give can him a vag. Can we have the biggest fucking tits imaginable? Like, I always want to picture Stallone with just giant fucking knockers. Shit. All right, I'll wait for the next one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can we just get a, can we just get to see with him doing the tuck? Man, what's with him? What's what happened to him? I don't know. Seventy eight. Wait, this had to be like when he was like seventy eight or something. So that does something to a man when you've been working in the film industry that long. You just want to try weird, fucked up shit and do some genre bending. <laughs> exactly. But um, but no, like Hard Times was a sick movie. Uh, like really is like pretty darn perfect. And oddly enough, even when I was just flipping through there. I know we like never take anything from Rotten Tomatoes serious at all, but I saw just like in the Wikipedia thing, it was like it had a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's like yeah. shit. That's... Every so often, I check. I don't like it. I don't really take Rotten Tomatoes. Like we said, we don't take Rotten Tomatoes seriously. But I'll check it once in a while because that's usually a good consensus of what a lot of people are gonna take the movie as or how well it's gonna do sometimes. And just look at that. Like, I didn't know that was ahead 100%, but that's good. I know it's older movies they're a little bit more lenient on. It's more newer movies where it's just like, mm-hmm, it was enjoyable, but it wasn't, you know, what we all hoped for. That's what every fucking major summer blockbuster is becoming. Like, it was good, but it could have been more. Like, that's every fucking movie. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Classic stuff always gets a little bit more of a, like, a pass. I, I think because it's like once something becomes, like, kind of like in time and it's timeless and it's you know of an era and so on it gets a little bit more and generally yeah it's like i, I would never even go to like rottentomatoes.com or anything like that but it just happened to be like right there and like because when you're scrolling through like a movie's page on wikipedia it's like you get the reception section and i just i mostly don't ever look at that but i just i saw 100 percent like whoa what the fuck it made me stop for a second yeah, that's good. That's good. But, I'm um, glad that this movie's well remembered. <clears throat> but this is a movie that's just kind of like it's a fun one. I think anybody should check it out. Oddly enough, there's actually I heard that there was like 30 minutes of this movie or so cut because it's kind of short. It's only like an hour and a half. 
but there's some some more extra fight scenes and so on which once again like whenever i see that i just always kind of wish somebody would put together like a blu-ray special edition and just have that version on there it doesn't have to be like the version it takes over but like why not if, if you knew you shot it couldn't you get somebody to put it back together and just see like well let's just see what the extended cut is just for like the hell of it this is an entirely different movie right here but apparently um and uh, I, I didn't really put put together at, at the moment, but like the whole uh, Paul Bettany character, Vision from Solo, mm-hmm. there was originally another guy that played him, and there was more scenes with that character. But since you know they had to do reshoots, and the that the, that character, the guy who originally played him, couldn't show up, it's like all right, well we gotta get Paul Bettany to play him now, and we just we, now thinking back, like well they do just kind of shoot it in that one room with him, don't they? So it's one of those things where like oh I wonder what else was in that movie. So if only they would release that, but you know they probably won't do that. I, if they got the footage, I think just show it. I think so too. I just think that like it's one of those ones like for a big studio, it's like really at the end of the day, how fucking hard is it to throw it? Like they'll tell you that it's expensive and hard, but it's like no, not really. Get a fucking editor. And just have them put those extra scenes in and so on. And just have that version, you know? Like, I really hope that they do the same thing of Justice League. And they put out, like, the, the all the other footage that fucking um, Zack Snyder kind of had. And just kind of did, like, his take. You know, the same way that they did Superman 2. Like, you got the Richard Donner cut and then the, uh, the other dude's cut. And so on like that. Mm-hmm. That stuff is really cool. And it's just, like, I feel like it will sell. And, you know... I, it was Justice League. You can even double dip it. Because I would go out and fucking buy Justice League right over again if you put out a fucking... Um, Zack Snyder cut of it. You hear that, Warner Brothers? You hear that? Yeah, I'm not going to double dip for anything, but I'll double dip for that. Boy, I tell you what. I'm curious to know, yeah, because apparently there's a, a version, I don't know if they actually filmed it, but there's apparently a version of the script where um, um, Darkseid comes in at the last minute and kills, uh, k- kills what's his Steppenwolf. name? Um, Steppenwolf, and they fight him for a minute or or it's implied they will fight him soon or something i i heard something about that i don't know if that's true but yeah but yeah it just sounds like it, it just it just was what's like i'd just be cool just to see that take just for whatever what it is because it sounds like it's also longer too it sounds like it's like two and a half hours as well and i think which seemed weird like some movie was only like an hour and 40 minutes yeah, that, or something like it was that. a little bit longer i think it was almost two hours but it was oh, it was yeah. fucking short for like being like the Justice League movie, you know what I mean? Like that's the length I expect maybe like Wonder Woman to be or like Green Lantern or something like that. You don't expect the Justice League film to be that short. Under two hours, yeah. You expect at least two and a half hour movie, but whatever. It was still a fun movie. Yes. Yeah. And uh, this movie was pretty awesome too. Yeah. So check out Hard Times. We'll put a little like link in for the Amazon for uh, to get a copy of Hard Times on either DVD or Blu-ray or what have you, or a digital copy, whatever whatever strikes your fancy, but something to go out of your way to check out if you've never seen it or if you need to watch it again or something like that. You can help support the podcast easily by clicking on that Amazon link, and it won't cost you any extra, but it'll send a little something our way. To, other than that, though, check out oldmanorange.com for more podcasts, comics, videos, animations, and more. Until then, I'm Spencer Scott Holmes. And I'm Rain Dunnigan. We'll see you some other time. Later, folks. Thanks again for listening to the Old Man Orange podcast. Be sure to check out oldmanorange.com for more podcasts, comics, animations, videos, and a whole lot more. You can easily support the show by buying something from one of our Amazon links on the website or in the show's description itself. Doesn't cost you a penny, but every single thing you buy from there just by using that link to take you to Amazon helps us out a bit. You can also really help the show out, though, by spreading the word the good old-fashioned way and rate and review us on all the sites that you find this podcast. Anything from iTunes to Podbean to Newgrounds, YouTube, you name it, any little bit helps. Give a sub and share it to your friends, family, any jamoke you see out on the street. You let them know about Old Man Orange Podcast. And be sure to check out the Old Man Orange comic book, Pizza Boys, on both Amazon and Comixology. Till then... We'll see you some other time.